in my eighth grade year, uh, I had a very uh, profound and unexpected experience in a really unlikely place. My family was going to a block party uh, where a bunch of families were coming to one of our friends' homes. And when we got there, we didn't know everybody. Um, in the, for the first probably hour or so, the adults are inside doing the adult stuff that's totally boring, like making dinner and stuff. And the kids were outside playing in the fenced-in yard, but I was a bit older than all the kids, so I'm just outside the fence on the sidewalk right near their driveway, and I'm skateboarding, and I'm out there by myself listening to music and skateboarding. And at one point, one of the dads comes out and he's checking on all the kids. And then he sees me skateboarding out in the driveway and he sees that there's a basketball hoop. So he comes outside the fence and he uh, grabs the basketball and starts shooting hoops and talking to me. And the conversation, you know, began with just polite niceties like, hey, who are you? What family are you with? Are you, do you have brothers or sisters here? Um, but it quickly turned to him interested in what I was doing. Oh, you're a skateboarder. How long have you been doing that? Who's your favorite skateboarder? Uh, what kind of music are you listening to? Oh, you're in eighth grade. How, do you, how are you experiencing school? And he actually stood there and talked to me for like an hour plus, just getting to know me, listening to me. And this was such a profound thing. You see, at this point in my life, uh, a, a lot of the relationships that I deeply cared about had shifted and there was a lot of loss in those relationships. And I felt very alone. And this guy who I'd never met before, he comes out there and he listens to me. He heard me. He saw me. He was a present presence with me there for about an hour. At one point while he's shooting hoops and I'm skateboarding, he actually passes me the back basketball. Now, if you know me, you know I don't sport, okay? And so uh, I'm getting ready to totally embarrass myself, and I'm out, you know, close to the three-point line, and he's like, just shoot it, and I shot it. And he said, actually, you have a pretty good form for your shot. Let me give you some pointers. And I found out he was a basketball coach, and we stood out there for about an hour, hour and 20 minutes, and he just heard, saw, and listened to me. He encouraged me. He was a present presence. And to be honest, to this day, I don't remember his name. I vaguely remember what he looked like, and I never met him again. But that moment was a marker moment, even to this day for me. You see, up until this point, when I was in eighth grade, I had heard the gospel a couple of times. I had some Christian family members who shared the gospel with me, and I, and I had uh, gone to a couple of church, church services, not many. Um, so I'd heard about Jesus and salvation, repentance and faith, but I hadn't gotten on board with any of it yet. But in this guy, it was the first time I ever experienced someone loving me like I was told that I was loved in the gospel. And I now look back on that moment with such fondness because I know that the Father God was loving me in a very difficult season of my life through one of his people. This man wasn't a pastor. He wasn't an elder. He wasn't a theologian. He wasn't a church leader. He was just a Christian. God is about the business of using ordinary people in ordinary moments for his extraordinary purposes. That man had a lasting impact on me that has borne fruit even to this day. Today, we're going to continue our series in the book of Mark, and I hope that you'll see exactly what I just said, that God uses ordinary people like that man and like the men we're going to see in this passage today, very ordinary people in ordinary moments for his extraordinary purposes and mission, that common people like you and I can have profound impact in the world in Christ. So we're going to dive into the book of Mark chapter one. Last week we began, and I just kind of want to bring us back to speed of where we've been, okay? The book of Mark is like an action movie, okay? It just goes from one scene of action to the next, to the next, to the next. Mark doesn't give a lot of detail. He just wants you to get the highlights, and we're moving forward. So last week we heard about that John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus' ministry, and he's preparing the way, and people are coming out to him and getting baptized. He's this weird dude who wears uh, uh, leather and eats locusts 
feasts and wild honey and, and, and he's kind of a wild man. People are coming to him and he's preparing the way for Jesus. Jesus comes and gets baptized. This epic moment where the Godhead is visible in this story. The father speaking from heaven, the son getting dunked and baptized and the spirit descending on him like a dove. This beautiful picture of the Trinity. And then as Jesus uh, begins his journey and right before he begins his journey in ministry, he's tempted by Satan himself in the desert. And then he begins his ministry with a pretty intense and theologically beautiful and rich uh, verse that kind of outlines what his mission will be as he brings his ministry into the fore in the last years of his life. Here's what he says. Verse 14, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So he says, the time was fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand or the kingdom of God, other translations say, is close or near, has come near to you. That's some of the other interpretations of this very passage. And when it says it's at hand, that's not a phrase we use often. It means literally as close as your hand is, the kingdom of God has come near to you. What this means is the kingdom of God is not just some future hope when we die. Jesus didn't come here and say, hey guys, hang out for 70, maybe 80 years, and then you enter the kingdom of God. No, his ministry begins with him proclaiming the kingdom of God has come near. Heaven and earth are meeting in the person and work of Jesus. And then he tells us how we enter into this kingdom. He says, repent. That is a remorseful turning from your sin to God and believe the gospel. Believe the good news that the Lord has sent a Messiah to redeem you. And so he, he, he begins with this grand picture of God's kingdom coming to earth and infiltrating the dominion of darkness and taking it over. The kingdom of God where Jesus is on the throne and he tells us, enter it by repentance and belief. And then he, he's going to show us in the coming verses how he intends to spread this kingdom. And if you're any strategist trying to set up your dominion and your kingdom, the way that Jesus goes about setting up his kingdom, it looks very counterintuitive. But he knew this was a wise thing to do. Look at how he begins his kingdom. It says, passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting it out into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. How does Jesus intend on bringing this kingdom to flourish and take over and, and thrive in the dominion of darkness, this depraved world that we live in? through common fishermen. And there's, there's several uh, people in these passages. So I really want us to be honed in on who is who. Okay, we're gonna, have, we're gonna meet four guys in here, plus Jesus. We know who Jesus is. There's four other guys here, okay? First one's Simon. Now, Simon and Andrew, they're brothers, okay? And they have a family fishing business on the Sea of Galilee. We know Simon, probably many of us know Simon more likely as Peter. For our intents and purposes today, I'm gonna try my best to remember to call uh, Simon, Simon Peter. So when I say Simon Peter, I'm talking about Peter, who we know in the New Testament as a guy who uh, was pretty zealous for Jesus. I mean, he made claims like, Jesus, I will die for you. He's the guy who, when Jesus is about to be arrested, Peter pulls out his sword and chops off the ear of the servant of the high priest. Like Peter was on board, but when things got difficult and Jesus' ministry looked like it was crumbling all around him, when Jesus gets arrested on his way to go get tried, Peter actually denies Jesus three times before the rooster crows. That's this Simon. This Simon is also the guy who wrote the books of first and second Peter. So when you think of Simon, Simon Peter, get locked into who he is. He's the guy who wrote those books, first and second Peter. He's the guy who traveled with Jesus. He was actually part of Jesus's inner circle, okay? And his brother, Andrew. Now we don't have a lot of information about Andrew from the biblical text. We do know that Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. We read about John the Baptist last week. He was a follower of John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, look, disciples, my disciples, don't follow me anymore. That's the guy. Go follow him. That's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew goes and follows Jesus. And so this is not the first time Simon and Andrew have met 
Jesus. They met him before. That account is in the early chapters of the book of John. You can read it there if you'd like to. So they have this family fishing business on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee was a freshwater lake. It was a huge lake. And uh, ancient historian Josephus actually estimates that at any given time during the fishing hours, there was, there was upwards of 300 to 330 fishing vessels on this sea. And what they would be doing is as they caught their fish, these freshwater fish were actually a delicacy in the ancient world. And so they would be exporting this all over the known world of the day. So when you think of Simon, Peter, and Andrew, his brother, think of people who aren't high society, but they're definitely not homeless. This would have been a lucrative business for the family catching freshwater fish. And while they're out there, these common fishermen, Jesus comes along And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now, we're going to do a lot of work on the statement of Jesus here. Follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. It's going to take a minute for us to get there because we have some more passage to get through. But I want you in your Bible, if you don't already have it, circle, underline, highlight the words, follow me. This is like the key that unlocks this passage. And if we don't understand Jesus's invitation to his disciples to follow him, we are going to totally misunderstand the rest of the passage. Very important uh, to, to, to catch what he means when he says, follow me. We'll do some work there, uh, but right now, just put a pin in that, okay? So he says, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now on the surface with 20, 24 eyes, this looks very weird, right? Like they're at their day job and Jesus comes along and he says, follow me, I'll make you become fishers of men. They leave their nets. They leave their livelihood. They leave their boats. They may have even left whatever catch they had for the day, which would provide for their life to follow Jesus. Like, can you imagine just being a dude on the shore watching this happen? If we don't understand the cultural context of what's going on here, it looks very strange. It'd be like if someone came into your workplace, a homeless, jobless, bearded dude came into your workplace and said, hey, come follow me. Would you not scratch your head a bit if one of your coworkers took off their hard hat, put down the chainsaw and followed Jesus out of the woods? I mean, it, it looks on the surface very like, what is going on here? Why did they leave uh, their, their livelihood behind to follow this guy? But as we begin to understand Jewish culture, that this was actually an honor to be invited to follow a rabbi. In Jewish culture, there were many itinerant rabbis all over the place, and they all had their own interpretations of the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. They would have had that memorized, and they'd go around preaching in open-air public spaces their interpretations of the Torah. And they had a gaggle of disciples they would follow them around. And to become a disciple of a rabbi was an honor for the individual. And it was not easy. You had to beg and plead. You had to apply for the position. This was not just some easy invitation. This was difficult for most of the rabbis in Jesus' day. It was difficult. And once you had the rabbi's attention, they would grill you, grill you on theology. What's your interpretation of the Nephilim? How do you interpret this passage? How much of the Torah do you have memorized? They could say, go to, I want you to recite for me Genesis 15 verse five. I mean, they they would just grill these prospective disciples. And once you became a disciple of a rabbi, it was an honor. It was like the spiritual Ivy Leagues of the day. Now that's culturally how rabbis and disciples function. Now look at how Jesus flips that cultural idea on its head. Whereas a disciple had to beg to become a follower of their rabbi, Jesus here invites the disciples in himself. The rabbi seeks out these men, these common, ordinary men that, that whom the, the, the spiritual ship for them has already sailed. They would have been rejected from rabbis. They, they would have grown up with the hopes of being a disciple of a rabbi and maybe one day even becoming a rabbi themselves. And we know they've been rejected and told, you are not enough. You are not worthy. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. You don't know enough of the Torah because they're fishermen. And so as fishermen, their only hope, 
would be that they could raise children that will one day become disciples and maybe rabbis themselves. So when Jesus comes along and says, hey, leave your day job behind you and come follow me, it makes total sense that they leave everything to follow him. This was an honor and a privilege. And this, uh, this phrase here, I will make you become fishers of men. When I first read this, I'm like, that's a really weird phrase. Okay. Like we're going to get bigger hooks and put some stakes on there and just throw them out in the marketplace. We're going to fish for people. Weird. Okay. But this would have been a common idiom of the day. This was something that rabbi said often. And the idea was you're going to bring more people into the way of your rabbi, into his understanding of the Torah, into the yoke of your rabbi. You're going to go out and you're going to bring more people in to the way of your rabbi and his teachings. And so when they heard this, this wouldn't have sounded like a strange call at all. They would have knew immediately what Jesus was calling them to. And Jesus, he, he gets Simon and Andrew to follow him. And then it says, verse 19, going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boats, n- mending the nets. Now, James and John are brothers and their papa Zebedee is there with them. It's another family fishing business. Um, again, they're not high society. They're not homeless. They're doing pretty well for themselves, fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And James and John, they get this awesome nickname by Jesus, the Sons of Thunder, because they've got some fiery zeal. It's a bit misguided, like there's one time, it's kind of weird, where they enter a village and the village people didn't welcome them. And so... <laughs> James and John come to Jesus and like, hey, they didn't roll out the welcome mat for us. No one offered us coffee. Why don't we just send fire down from heaven on these guys? And Jesus is like, whoa, chill out, dude. Like, and he rebukes them. But, but they're, they have this fiery zeal and they're also mama's boys. Okay, there's a story where their mom comes to Jesus and begs him that when when you're in your kingdom in glory in the new heaven, can you make sure that my boys are at your left and your right hand side of your throne in the power and honorable positions? And Jesus is like, that's not even my place to decide. You don't know what you're asking. But they were mama's boys who had some fiery zeal. And so when you think of James and John, John is actually the guy who wrote the book of John. He also wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He also wrote Revelation, okay? So that you can lock into who he is. James was his brother, okay? Zebedee's the dad. And they come, they're, they're on the, the, the Sea of Galilee. They're mending their nets. This might have been the end of the day where they're repairing their nets for the next day's catch. And it says, immediately... That's Mark's favorite word, by the way. He just wants to book it. He's so excited about Jesus. He's just like, immediately, I got to tell you, this happened. And then immediately this happened. He gets so excited. He says, and immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Now this on the surface again, it looks worse than what Simon, Peter, and Andrew did. (laughs) Not only do they leave their nets and their boat and their catch, they leave their dad. (laughs) And, and, and when I first read this, I was like, wow, that, that has to hurt his father heart. Like the kids just like, peace out, dad. I'm going with this guy now. But again, this would have been an honor for the disciples, for James and John, and not just for them, but for their family as well. So Zebedee isn't standing on the shoreline, like wistfully looking at the waves, like, oh man, I'm all alone. He is beaming with pride that his sons have been called in to a relationship with the rabbi. So we have these four guys, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, who are brothers, James and John, who are brothers, all fishermen, all common, ordinary men who the boat has sailed, uh, spiritually speaking, on them making huge impact by following a rabbi, and they're invited into a journey with Jesus. But what exactly is this journey look like? What does Jesus mean when he says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men? The first thing seems pretty obvious, but follow Jesus. Now this seems very self-explanatory, but we get this very messed up very easily. That's why I said earlier, this is the key to unlock this passage. And if we don't understand what the invitation actually was, we're going to have some funky theology. So let's go back to Jesus' words. Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. 
The invitation for them to follow Jesus was not some sort of abstract, distant following like you can do on social media, following people you've never met. It also wasn't like, you know, when you follow a sports person, I don't follow sports, but there's sports people out there and they have careers and people follow those and know the statistics and you can follow their career. That's not the type of following he's talking about. This is also not an invitation to join a political party. It was not an invitation to vote a certain way. This was not an invitation to adopt a certain moral code. This was not an invitation to religious activity. The invitation to follow Jesus was the invitation to be with him. The invitation to follow Jesus was the invitation to be with him, not to do anything for him. I want that really clear, okay? The, I'm not, I want to caveat that, that, that in the kingdom of God and the mission of God, there are things that his, his people are called to do. Absolutely. This invitation to the disciples and thereby the invitation to us as well was not an invitation to do for Jesus, but to be with Jesus. They would have literally followed him. Like they would have slept where he slept. They would have eaten together. They would have been there when the masses were thronging Jesus. They would have been there when Jesus said some really hard words and everybody left. They would have experienced joys and sorrows, ugly times, beautiful times, the whole gamut. They would have been close proximity with Jesus. The invitation to follow Jesus is an invitation to intimate friendship and proximity with the God of the universe to be with him, not just do stuff for him. Jesus purchased the way for you and I to be with him. We don't have to do anything to earn the right to be with him. When Simon and, and Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John heard this, they would have known we're going to follow this guy literally everywhere. Think of like a toddler and how they follow their mom, right? You can't even go to the bathroom without them banging on the door. These, these, these disciples were with Jesus everywhere he went. There was a saying of the day that said, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. And that, that was actually considered an honor that you would walk so closely behind your rabbi as you strode down the dirt roads of the first century that his dust would land on you. It meant that you had this close, intimate proximity to him. This was doing life together. So I'll say it again. The invitation to follow Jesus has always been the invitation to be with him. So how's your relationship with Jesus? Would you describe it as intimate friendship? Are you with him? Do you read the scriptures not for information or to create some sort of theological construct? Theology is important, but if theology doesn't point us to be with Jesus, it's for not. Do you read the scriptures to be with him in relationship day in and day out? Do you, do you pray and have rhythms of relational prayer with Jesus day in and day out? Or is Jesus kind of at a distance? How would you describe your relationship? Their call to follow him was to go wherever he went, to sit at his feet, to be present with him. Our call is no different. And there are lots of distractions that want to pull us away from being with our Lord. But what he purchased you in his death, burial, and resurrection, in his perfect life, in the perfect sacrifice that he made, was the ability to be with him, with him in your home, in your workplace, where you hang out in your social circles, wherever you go, God is present with you. Are you present with him? Are you aware of his presence? Are you building relationship with him? Or have you got the distorted version that says following Jesus is really more about doing stuff for him? Notice in this verse, the only thing the disciples are told to do is follow. 
Jesus does everything else. The only thing they're called to do is to be with him. And a natural byproduct is all the rest. So have you spent time with Jesus, relational, intimate friendship with Jesus? Or have you kept him at an arm's length? The next thing that happens when they follow Jesus, Jesus says something is going to happen. There's going to be a a natural byproduct of following him, and that is being changed by Jesus. The scripture knows nothing of a disciple who never experiences transformation. It's not just my words. Look at Jesus here. He says, follow me. And a byproduct of that following, what happens when we truly follow Jesus is this. I will make you become fishers of men. Now, we're going to get to the fishers of men phrase here in a moment. But I want to stop here at the I will make you become. Twice in that phrase, make you become, there's two words in there that indicate transformation. Jesus kind of doubles down on his plan to change these common fishermen and make them become a people who are worthy or, or who are actually capable of becoming fishers of men, rather. Not worthy, but capable of becoming fishers of men. I will make you become. And the New Testament epistles actually bear weight on what this transformative journey really truly looks like. Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit there is expounded on chapter 5. And, and it's this picture of what God wants his people to look like. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is the transformative uh, uh, character that God wants all of his children to exhibit. Why is this so important? Because if we're invited into Jesus's journey of advancing the kingdom of God, we really better exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Because any expression of the ministry of the kingdom of God should exhibit the fruit of the spirit of God. As a mouthful, I'm going to say it again. Any expression of the ministry of the kingdom of God should exhibit the fruit of the spirit of God. If not, it's very easy to clobber people with truth. It's very easy to beat people upside the head with the Bible if we don't exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, the loving interaction, the patient, gracious, all of the the fruit of the Spirit, those terms should come to the fore in our advancement of the gospel. And so this is a character uh, uh, statement here. Jesus is about growing us in our character. Are you more loving than you were a year ago? That's the fruit of the Spirit. If you are living in submission, which is our role in transformation, Jesus is the one who makes us become, we submit. And as we submit, we should grow, not perfectly, please hear me, not perfectly, but increasingly, we should grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Are you more joyful? Are you more peaceful than you have been? And if I know one thing, it's this. We are often our own worst critics. I know that's true for me. It's hard for me to see transformation in my own life. And so I encourage you, if you are, if you are thinking through this idea of transformation, uh, wrestle with the question, have you been transformed? And be willing to have the conversation with your spouse, your parent, a trusted friend, someone that knows your heart. Because we often don't see the transformation that God really has brought about in our lives. And it's so valuable to get outside uh, perspective on that. And the second question I'd ask you to wrestle with when it comes to transformation is this. Where do you need transformation? And do you believe the Lord can do that? Do you believe that the Lord can transform broken marriages, broken relationships, broken parenting, broken histories, hurts, habits, hangups? Do you believe that God has the power to change patterns of bondage or brokenness or sin? Do you believe that he can do that? This is a beautiful promise for God's people. As we be with Jesus, follow him, surrendered to his spirit, a natural byproduct of, over time is change. So how have you been changed and where do you need transformation? And God takes these fishermen. 
I mean, they're common fishermen who had no real hopes of having a much spiritual impact. And he makes massive impact in the world that you and I both feel today as a result of their saying, yes, I will follow. And that gets us to our last point today. A disciple is somebody who's on mission with Jesus. Jesus said it this way, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Again, this is an idiom of the day that would have indicated your job is to go out and and bring more people into the way of your rabbi Jesus. Follow me and I will make you become, I'll give you the character that is gonna help you to fulfill this endeavor of bringing people into the way of Jesus. This is a missional mindset. And Jesus is very interesting. He actually begins and ends the book of Mark with this very same idea. He begins his ministry and ends his ministry with the very same idea. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he says, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Jesus was always about the mission. He was sent here by the father to advance the kingdom, bring people into it through salvation, repentance, and faith. And he wanted his followers to do the same. He came and accomplished the work for salvation to be complete. And now he's tasked common ordinary men and women like you and I and like these fishermen to have extraordinary impact in this world. Do you believe God can impact the world through you? That God can take even common fishermen and use them for profound impact? Here's what happened with these four guys. Peter, he wrestled with Jesus, denying him, and, and, and he, he thought it was over. He denied him three times, rooster crows. He remembers the words of Jesus, and he thought this is all over. But Jesus, after his resurrection, reinstates him and gives him a mission to tend the flock, to protect the sheep, to feed the lambs. And Peter goes on to be instrumental in the early church, a pivotal figure of leadership in the fledgling movement that Jesus began. And, and then he, he writes two books, the first and second Peter, that were instructive for the early church. Peter actually went from a man who was afraid of people so much that he denied Jesus to a man who believed in his Lord so much he died a very similar death to Jesus, a death on a cross, although his cross was most likely turned upside down, biblical historians say because he didn't believe that he was worthy of the same death of his Lord. That's transformation. That's impact. That's the journey Jesus invites us into. Andrew, his brother, most uh, biblical historians, this isn't in scripture, but outside ancient historical accounts say that Andrew was the guy who took the gospel all the way to Ukraine, the, the area that's modern day Kiev, Ukraine. That's impact from a common fisherman. James and John, James was the guy who took the gospel as far as Spain. John is the guy who wrote the book of John, which by the way, the last couple chapters, he tells us his whole purpose in writing that is that we might believe, that we might come into the way of Jesus, his rabbi. He also wrote the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he wrote the book of Revelation. He was persecuted for his faith and relentless in sharing the gospel because Jesus transformed him and he had profound impact that you and I still feel today, thousands of years later. Do you believe that just like these common fishermen, Jesus can use you? He has invited you into a journey. He says, follow me, be with me, become like me, and then go out and do as I did. Become a fisher of men, become a disciple who makes disciples. Do you believe you can do that? You see, often we kind of excuse ourselves from this mission of Jesus because we're looking at ourselves. I don't know enough Bible. I'm not enough this. I'm not, I don't know how to share the gospel well enough. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. And what we need is a sight adjustment. It's not about us. God is about the business of using ordinary common men and women like you and I for his extraordinary purposes and mission. So will you join him in this journey? I'm going to release you to the campuses. Thank you. Love you guys. 
Thank you guys so much for sticking around. Uh, it's a joy to be here with you and just kind of unpack some scripture. And I just want to leave you with a, a challenge and a question. Um, at Family Church, we have what's called uh, the Discipleship Triangle. This is what it looks like. And this is how we define a disciple. Now, clearly, from the language, we've pulled this directly from the verse we just unpacked. Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And so Jesus, his own words, was fo- a disciple is somebody who follows him, somebody who's being changed by him, and somebody who's living on mission with him. And so the question I just want you to honestly self-evaluate, like hold up a mirror to yourself. I know that's not always comfortable, but just be okay asking the question. Do these things show up in my life? Follow Jesus. Are you with Jesus in intimate friendship with him? Being changed by Jesus, can you look back over the arc of your journey with Jesus and and see, yeah, there's been real transformation. And again, I encourage you to bring a friend into that conversation, a spouse, a parent, someone you trust that knows your heart and can speak into that with clarity. And the last one here, a disciple, somebody who's on mission with Jesus. This is what Jesus came to inaugurate his kingdom, to, le- to unleash it on the dominion of darkness and overcome the darkness one life at a time. And he's invited you into that process. So have you joined him in his mission? I just want you to take some time today and evaluate these three aspects. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the gospel that redeems us and thank you for the invitation from your son to follow and be a part of the life transforming work of the kingdom of God. I just pray you'd give us gracious curiosity as we evaluate these areas in our lives. Uh, Do we spend time with Jesus? Are we being changed by him? And are we living on mission with him? Give us that gracious curiosity, I pray in Jesus name. Amen. All right, guys, thank you again so much for sticking around. I love you. Have a good Sunday.